Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily, I'm Lauren Izzo. And coming up in this edition, free pizza. Israelis flock to vaccine centers as officials give away tasty incentives. 3,000 targets in 24 hours, the Israel Air Force warns Hezbollah in its latest war drill. It's looking a lot like winter in the Holy Land. Israel sees its first snowfall of 2021. vaccinated. That's the milestone Israel passed on Tuesday as the country surpasses even the most optimistic expectations in its race to lead the world as it inches towards an exit from the global COVID-19 pandemic. So what is the thing that is enticing so many Israelis to get the shot? Pizza and hummus, of course. Hanna Rifkin reports. As Israel begins to roll out its lockdown exit plan, more and more people are realizing life will not be able to resume for those who haven't vaccinated against COVID-19. On Sunday, malls and prayer services will open up for everyone, but certain facilities will only allow vaccinated individuals to enter, like hotels, gyms and cultural events. In order to get the ball rolling, the Tel Aviv municipality is bribing vaccinators with snacks. So what we are doing is bringing the vaccination centers into the community, putting them in community centers and incentivizing people also by creating a friendly atmosphere, giving them food and drink, a family like atmosphere to allow the people that are still a bit hesitant to come and vaccinate themselves as well. Theodore Slazen was the four millionth Israeli to get the job on Tuesday, accompanied by the prime minister and the health minister. <laughs> The Prime Minister urging the population to continue to get inoculated. I want to say that I want to say that Nearly 2.7 million Israelis have had both doses of the vaccine. Still, more of the population must be vaccinated with both before the majority of restrictions will disappear. On Tuesday, Israel's health ministry recorded 4,406 new cases with a positive infection rate of 6.4%. There are just under 1,000 patients in critical condition with 297 on ventilators. 5,463 Israelis have died from COVID. As Israel gets ready to open different facilities around the country, an international judo tournament set to take place in Tel Aviv this week has hit a roadblock, as five foreign participants have tested positive for the virus, raising questions about the safety of international sports amid the pandemic. Still, it will only be a matter of days until the country turns the page to a new chapter, hopefully with the rest of the world following close behind. Hanna Rifkin, ILTV. To call or not to call, that is the question on many minds when it comes to Joe Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu. It's been just a few days shy of a month since the 46th president of the United States was sworn in at the White House. And although he has spoken to several world leaders, he still hasn't picked up the phone to call the Israeli prime minister. Now the State Department is making assurances that it's nothing personal. And in fact, it will be Biden's first phone call to the Middle East as president of the United States. Well, first let me say on Israel, I know there's been some questions about when the president will speak with Prime Minister Netanyahu, which was, I think, the root of that question or how the question started. So um, let me first confirm for you that uh, his first call uh, with a leader in the region will be with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, it will be uh, soon. I don't have an exact day for you, but it is soon. Stay tuned. Uh, Israel is, of course, an ally. Uh, Israel is a country where we have an important strategic security relationship. And our team is fully engaged, not at the uh, at the head of state yet level quite yet, but very soon. Uh, but our team is fully engaged, having constant conversations at many levels uh, with the Israelis. 
And more on that Israel-U.S. dynamic. Knesset members have approved a $15 billion arms deal with the United States, set to include a squadron of advanced F-35 fighter jets. The package also reportedly includes components for the Aero Missile System and the Iron Dome Defense System. This would be the first foreign military sale to Israel announced under the new administration of President Biden, but the deal was likely initially laid out during the Trump administration. Now, joining me now with more is political analyst, American foreign policy expert, and professor at the State University of New York Maritime College, Mark Meyerowitz. Thank you so much for joining me today, sir. What a pleasure. So the deal was announced by the Biden administration, but likely dates back to the Trump administration, as I just said. Is this a trend we're going to continue to see Biden sort of latching on to policy created by Trump, or will his stance on Israel specifically begin to shift? I don't see the shift there because the longstanding relationship between Israel and the United States in terms of arms sales is rock solid and furthermore has total support in both houses of Congress. So I think this is really a continuation of the great relationship and the great support the United States and, the, and its people have for the state of Israel. Where you'll see some shifts might be on the uh, Palestinian policy and also the regional policy in terms of the deal with the UAE, which has been the, you know, the UAE Israel uh, Abraham Accords has a component of F-35s being supplied uh, to um, uh, the UAE, and there, there's opposition in the Senate. Right. And this maybe has been a, a, a consternation in Israel. It's been an extremely <laughs> contentious issue with the F-35 having to do specifically uh, with sales to the UAE. So where do we stand on that right now? Mm. I mean, I'll give you my prediction in a minute. Uh, I think the deal is in trouble, at least imminently. It, I don't think that deal is going to happen very soon. I think if you listen to Anthony Blinken, the, um, uh, the new Secretary of State, in his testimony in Congress, he said that America is going to take a hard look at the deal. Why is that? Because the concern is, first of all, the quantitative military edge that Israel has must be uh, must be preserved. And furthermore, there is concern. Look, Biden has paused the F-35 to UAE. He has paused or stopped the deal with Saudi Arabia. Why is that? Because of Yemen. But the UAE also has under other interactions in Libya. And, there, and this is Biden's concern is to uh, halt such sales. And also the concern that giving the F-35 to uh, the UAE could mean the American technology uh, uh, slipping out to Russia and to China, which is very, very dangerous. Uh, my prediction, I believe, and this would be, I think, in terms of Israel, if you think about it, when President Trump proposed this deal, there was some uh, consternation and some conflict in terms of Benny Gantz and others in Israel saying they didn't like the deal. Trump made the deal, and that was the glue that put the Abraham Accords together. Right now, there's a new administration in town. They're looking at this deal very carefully. The Saudi deal, they've actually put on hold. Maybe it's not going to happen. I think that's where the shift is going to be. Now, the other possibility is to have the United States give a more modified F-35 to the UAE and allow Israel to modify and get certain tech super technology that can always preserve its quantitative, qualitative military edge at all times. This is pivotal. So I think this step is going to be delayed, delayed. And I think that is going to help Israel to do modifications and do things with the United States that it needs to do to preserve its own security. All right. Some really interesting shifts going on in the Middle East. Thank you so much, Mark Meyerowitz. My pleasure. Well, Israeli cabinet ministers were summoned Tuesday evening to an urgent meeting amid intensive talks between top Israeli and Russian officials on a humanitarian issue pertaining to Syria. Some ministers saying that the meeting, whose details have been put under embargo by the IDF military censor, revolved around a sensitive security issue. While the details of the meeting remain unknown, Israeli Foreign Minister Gabi Ashkenazi also had a phone conversation with his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. Ashkenazi emphasizing Russia's vital role in preventing Iran's progression towards a nuclear capability, as well as its efforts of enrichment in the region. Israel held a surprise military drill on its northern border this week with a stern message for Hezbollah. 
The exercise, which ended on Tuesday, tested the Israel Air Force's ability to strike 3,000 targets in Lebanon within just 24 hours. It's a very large scale. The event that started this event is the attack from the land of Hezbollah to the Israeli army's army. חיל האוויר נערך לתגובה ובהמשך בוצע עוד ירי לעבר כלי טיס נוסף. אנחנו כחיל דואגים לשמור על העליונות האווירית ואנחנו לא נוכל לקבל ירי של מערכות נשק לעבר כלי טיס בזירה שבה אנחנו פועלים ובעצם בתרגיל הזה אנחנו מתרגלים את הפעולות של כל החיל למעבר לחירום, להתמודדות עם איומים כאלו Following that exercise, Hezbollah Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah responding to the drill, saying, after all the recent threats from Israel, no one can guarantee that it won't lead to war. Israel will see things it hasn't seen since its inception. Okay, moving on now. The Gaza Strip is set to receive coronavirus vaccinations for the first time since the start of the pandemic after getting approval from Israel. A shipment containing 1,000 of Russia's Sputnik V vaccines is currently making its way from the Palestinian Authority, having finally been okayed, to the era's border crossing. Two weeks ago, Ramallah received about 100,000 doses of the Sputnik vaccine as a gift from Russian authorities, 2,000 of which were donated specifically to the Hamas-ruled enclave. The PA requested to transfer the vaccines to Gazan authorities on Tuesday, but Israel did not approve the move until today. Now let's get more information from Gershon Baskin, columnist for the Jerusalem Post and Al Quds newspaper. Thank you so much for joining me today. Welcome. So first of all, um, if you could just give us some background of what the current health situation in Gaza is. Are they currently in lockdown? Um, they're supposedly in lockdown. Mostly they're in lockdown on Fridays and Saturdays, uh, just like in the West Bank, as well as the official policy is that most of the week things are open. This is a very small territory with more than 2 million people, uh, and it's very difficult to keep people under lockdown. The economy is suffering greatly, and uh, the virus is actually more contagious when people are locked up in their homes. We're dealing with small homes and large families. So uh, it's very difficult to maintain uh, a secure lockdown. So we understand that those um, vaccines are on the way to Gaza right now. Um, I'm wondering why did it take so long to get approval for the shipment to get into the Strip? First of all, we're dealing with a very small amount of doses that went to, today, a thousand doses, and it's mainly for the uh, first-line health workers in Gaza. Uh, the issue here is that the family of Hadar Golden, one of the two Israeli soldiers' bodies who are being held by Hamas in Gaza since uh, the war of 2014, have put pressure on the government not to allow any of these uh, vaccinations to get into Gaza, along with other, uh, um, other goods moving into Gaza, until Hamas uh, releases the bodies of the two Israeli soldiers and the two Israeli civilians who are presumed to be alive, Avera Mengisto, an Isra uh, Israeli Ethiopian, and uh, Hisham Asayed, a Bedouin Israeli. And this is meant to be seen as a, a, a means of pressure on the Hamas government. It hasn't worked. This should be noted. And is it likely to work from now going forward? No, it's not likely to work. I think uh, uh, that one of the things that we faced in the past six years of negotiations or non-negotiations between the two sides is the total lack of trust between the parties and the lack of goodwill between the parties. Uh, holding back uh, vaccinations and medications and other goods going into Gaza strengthens the belief in Gaza that Israel is, is never interested in living in peace with Gaza. Uh, Israel has no reason to believe that Hamas is willing to live in peace with Israel. And we have an ongoing process which spirals continually out of control of building relationships based on non-trust. Uh, I think it's time to try something new. So back to you know the health situation for just a second. As we said, it's only 1,000 doses coming to Gaza today, uh, only for frontline healthcare workers. How helpful is that really going to be? And are they going to get more anytime soon? Well, I, th I think it's also we don't know what the effectiveness of the Sputnik vaccination is also. And we haven't seen data on Sputnik as opposed to Pfizer and Moderna and AstraZeneca. Um, we don't know actually how good it is, but I think it's important that we 
uh, have everyone vaccinated in Gaza, the 2.1 million people who are living there, first with the healthcare workers and then with everyone else. Uh, there is no border of the for the virus between Gaza and Israel. Uh, the virus crosses and it will cross and Israel ha should have an interest that everyone in Gaza should be vaccinated, uh, that our neighbors shouldn't be dying from corona. And if we want to put an end to this pandemic uh, in our own country, in, an, in the neighboring areas that we essentially control, it is in our interest that everyone gets a vaccination. Okay, Gershon Baskin, thank you so much for this really important perspective. Thank you. Okay, a Kuwaiti singer and actress, Ibdisam Hamid, known by her stage name Basma Al Kuwaiti, sent shockwaves through the Arab world when she announced last week that she intends to renounce Islam and convert to Judaism. In a video she posted on Twitter, Hamid said that her decision stemmed from the fact that Islam violates women's rights and does not treat them with dignity. She spoke to Ynet this morning in an exclusive interview about her decision to change her religion and how it was inspired by Israeli music. Um, I felt that a uh, few months, uh, you know, it's starting when I uh, heard, you know, uh, Amra Adam, and, um, you know, when I understand uh, uh, what they say in the songs, I like it. And, uh, and I'm starting... Uh, by the songs, uh, I look for the religion and um, I like it. The singer also spoke about the threats to her life and her conviction to be whoever she wants. You know, the people, they are in from me and also they threaten me, um, you know, to kill me. And, uh, and I know that uh, it will be, this happened, you know. So, it is uh, my, uh, conviction what I want to to be I I think it's uh, uh, what I get or I, I change my religion it's up to me not to, to another people okay moving on now sustainable fashion is a new fad here in Israel and around the world a fashion and design exhibit called round trip is taking place at the Tel Aviv port this Sunday just as government COVID restrictions begin to let up now here to give us an inside look is Ynet reporter Yulia Kara. Hi, Yulia. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about the nature of this exhibit and how unique it is in Israel and where exactly uh, do these ideas stem from? Well, this exhibit is organized by a fashion house, Israeli fashion house, Kom Il Fo, which uh, was founded uh, over over 20 years ago and is focused on, on blue and white, blue and white manufacturing, blue and white designs, and basically has um, has been advocating for slow fashion and, and eco fashion way before it became a trend and a fad. And um, basically this exhibit is aimed at, at changing um, the, the consumerism, the reckless consumerism behavior that, um, that people everywhere, including Israel, have at the moment where we just buy things because it makes us feel good, but we don't form any kind of connections with the clothes that we have. So um, this um, this exhibit is aimed at that. And also um, from the side of manufacturing, uh, everything is made from recycled materials, right. um, which is which is also aimed at changing basically um, the way manufacturing uh, world operates um, today. So, Yulia, as you're speaking, we're seeing um, some images of what to look forward to uh, in this event. What are you most looking forward to? Well, um, there are a few designers that, um, that, that create not only fashion items, but also art in general, just art items that, from discarded materials, uh, such as plastic containers, for example. And what they're offering is if you come with a clothing piece they will remake it for you using those unique items. Or um, on the contrary, if you come with them with a piece of some discarded item, they will um, incorporate it into their work uh, on the spot, wow. which is quite amazing. Uh, and of course, Yulia, we can't ignore the elephant in the room, COVID-19. So what are organizers going to be doing um, according to the restrictions having to do with the pandemic? Are people going to have to be vaccinated in order to go to the event? What will happen here? 
Uh, no, they don't. They don't have to be vaccinated, as far as I know, because exhibits operate on the same rules as museums. And in order to go to a museum, you don't have to be vaccinated. So basically, the restrictions are basic uh, health restrictions that we've been um, living with for the past few months, which is uh, face masks, uh, personal hygiene, and uh, social distancing. So uh, just just basic uh, basic restrictions that we've been accustomed to. And Yulia, this is the the first sort of fashion event um, that we're seeing happen as the market starts to open up as we're coming out of this lockdown. Are we going to see more in-person fashion events uh, as time progresses? Um, this is uh, the thing about this event is that it's more of an exhibit. This is not a fashion show. This is not a runway show. This is an exhibit which operates under the same guidelines as a museum. So I think uh, we will see more of the same because it's easier to organize, it's easier to stage, it's easier to get people uh, under the COVID restrictions to these sort of events. So yeah, I think I think fashion will will adapt and um, we'll see more more shows similar to this one. It's really nice to see things starting to get back to normal. Yulia, thank you so much for this. Thanks for having me. Okay, green passports might seem like the hot topic at every water cooler or Zoom meetup, but it's hard to imagine cultural events coming back after such a long hiatus. Well, the Jerusalem municipality is planning its first event of 2021, a light show. The city will be illuminating and transforming iconic landmarks into works of art. Until the day when tourists can breeze through the streets of Jerusalem once again, the Jerusalem Follow the Lights interactive experience will also be available to viewers at home as if they were there. The event will kick off on Sunday, February 21st. Well, it wasn't a white Christmas, but at least it will be a white February. <laughs> Overnight snowstorms were expected to hit Jerusalem, Mount Hermon, Tzfat, and other areas in the north of the country. Take a look at some of the scenes from around the country covered in white. Okay, let's go live now to ILTV reporter Hanna Rifkin, who isn't in a snowstorm, but certainly caught in the rain. Hanna, what's going on where you are? Hi, Lauren. So there's currently no rain, but I'm being basically blown away by the wind. There are severe winds throughout the country, especially on the coast. Um, heavy rain and scattered thunderstorms are expected to continue. Throughout tomorrow, there was a lot of rain this morning. Uh, flash flood warnings have been announced in the Dead Sea and Judean Desert areas, and flood warnings as well on the coast of central Israel. Emergency personnel are standing by and prepared to help anyone who needs it. Hannah, we also heard reports that Jerusalem and other parts of the country uh, were supposed to have snow overnight. What can you tell us about that? So Jerusalem is gearing up for about four inches or 10 centimeters of snow expected to begin this afternoon. Uh, the Jerusalem municipality is preparing snow clouds and salting the roads in preparation. Okay, Hannah, and what can we expect for tonight and tomorrow? Tonight's lows will average 43 degrees Fahrenheit or six degrees Celsius, and tomorrow's highs will average at about 55 degrees Fahrenheit or 13 degrees Celsius. This is all very cold weather for Israelis, especially in comparison to what we had over the weekend, which was quite lovely weather. Back to you. Thank you, Hannah, and stay warm. And now, just before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. I think a very talented video editor uh, made our prime minister and the news anchor of our country's biggest news edition do a dance in their interview. That was from a couple of days ago. Hilarious. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.25 shekels to the American dollar and 2.56 shekels to the Canadian dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Then don't forget to visit the all-new and improved ILTV website at ILTV.tv and let us know what you think. Subscribe to our newsletter for the latest updates while you're there. I'm Lauren Izo. Thanks for watching.